Hi, everyone. So today uh, we are opening up our March Molly Tommy panel. And this month we're talking about confronting the stigma of bisexuality. And even though even though uh, bisexuality is common and not a new concept, it's often misunderstood and heavily stigmatized, not only in the straight community, but also in the queer communities. So we're gonna hit upon some of those subjects. So tonight uh, I'll have our panelists introduce themselves and we'll go ahead and get started. And take it away, Courtney. Sure, I'm Courtney Fay Long and I am a bisexual author and speaker and life coach. And um, I wrote a book about my own journey of coming out as bisexual that I self-published in 2012 and Heather designed the book cover for it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I teach a bunch of different topics, but I'm, I'm just really excited to be here tonight. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Archelaus, also bisexual, non-binary, and um, I am a coach and a founder of the Intuitive Art Academy, author, uh, artist, and just thanks for having me. This is really amazing. Great. And, and those of you out there, you probably know me. I'm Heather Brown and I'm with Molly Tommy. So first off, we'll get started. And uh, people watching may have noticed that we only have two panelists this month. Normally we have four to six and we have people on the wait list. I'm just going to throw this out there for Courtney and Rachel. We had a really tough time finding people and uh, finding people that wanted to commit or finding people that, that are bisexual. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I have a lot of bisexual friends who are not out publicly, and so they wouldn't be comfortable coming on the panel. And I also have actually some friends that have regular same-sex attractions or you know, multiple gender attractions who don't actually identify as bisexual or pansexual. So yeah, that's one part of it, I think. I mean, I would say the same. I have a lot of people in my life who have like bi curiosity, but don't consider themselves bisexual or just haven't had that relationship where they would feel more comfortable calling themselves bisexual. So yeah, I guess like, there's definitely some barriers for people. Now, Rachel, when you introduced yourself, you said bisexual, but not non-binary. Could you explain that a little bit further? Because uh, the old way of thinking, I think, oh, you're bisexual, so you like men and women. But uh, the the scope now of bisexual has become um, has become much wider. Yeah. So I am non-binary. I don't know if I said oh, I'm sorry. Not non-binary, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, I struggled with that a little bit when I. I came to understand myself as more gender fluid. Um, and I think it's just an easier way to talk about it though. Like I am bisexual, even though I don't identify with a specific gender uh, across the board, though sometimes I feel more, you know, all of the um, above, but in different times. Um, and I do consider myself attracted to all gender non-conforming and you know gender just doesn't really play a role for me in attraction but I still consider myself bisexual because it's kind of where I started it's where I started identifying and as I was growing up um, that's what I called myself and so I feel comfortable with that even though it doesn't exactly make sense with all the language we have now you know yeah, we're always evolving and our alphabet soup, uh, you know, is always growing. But I think I think as as we're growing, like I said, it's evolving. So th that's great. So we'll also uh, start off with a question. How did you first discover your bisexuality or your bisexual community? Yeah, for me, I was 14, almost 15 years old, and I had a dream that I kissed my female cousin, who was my best friend at the time. And that is how I discovered that I was bisexual, was through a dream. And I, I really think 
that it was something I didn't have any context for. I didn't know bisexual people. I didn't know that it would be okay for me to be attracted to a girl, let alone my cousin too. So I feel like my subconscious had to bring it to me through a dream. And then, yeah, it was just an interesting journey because I told my cousin, I was really nervous, but I told her and I thought we would laugh it off and just say, what a weird dream. But instead she said like, we should kiss. And, and so we did. And so that was kind of the start of me just starting to feel that, that I, yeah, I think I'm bisexual, but then I it scared me because at the time I was, I was being raised religious. I was originally Catholic, but by this time my family had switched to become Lutheran and I just didn't think it was okay. I thought it was really wrong to be bisexual. And I didn't, like I said, it didn't, I didn't know any other bisexual people. And so I just decided that I wasn't bisexual for years. And I just decided I'm, I'm just straight. Like I kind of went into denial. Then when I went into college at the University of Michigan, I actually was an LGBTQ advocate as a straight ally, which is kind of funny because this whole time I was in complete denial that I was bisexual. But then by the time I was 26, I fell in love with a woman and that's when I decided that I needed to come out to my family and to friends. And, and that's when I discovered the bisexual community. So I was about 10 and I was, I remember this so distinctly. I was in my best friend's bedroom and we were just hanging out. Um, and I told her like, I have a feeling I'm going to be bisexual. And I didn't really know what that meant. I just knew like, I, it would make sense for me to be attracted to boys and girls is what I would have thought at the time, you know? And she looked at me and she said, ew. <laughs> and like, that's so fitting for what we're talking about today with the stigma, because that really shut me down. And for the, you know, remaining years until I was an adult, I did have same sex attractions and kind of like a little bit of play um, with the same gender, but it never got anywhere serious. And I don't think I let myself really explore until um, my like late twenties, kind of similarly to you, Courtney. Um, and so, yeah, that's how I discovered I was bisexual. I just kind of popped into my head and I said it and I didn't, hadn't really thought about it before. And then I got shot down. Um, so, yeah. What do you mean you, you got shot down? <laughs> Is that relating to uh, t telling your family or you got shot down uh, by a per another person? Just, yeah, just my friend saying, ew. Like, oh. be, and a couple of years later, her sister was bisexual and kind of experimenting in her words. And uh, my friend was just really against that. And just, so this was the closest person to me in my life, other than my family, like really rejecting um, being bisexual. And I definitely was affected by that. You know, I, I kind of shut off a little bit. Later on in, in life, um, my like mid late twenties, I remember I was going to go on a date with a woman and I just, I was at a bar with my dad and I told him like, Hey dad, I'm going on a date with a woman. And he's like, okay. So I didn't have any hard time with my family when I ended up telling them they were completely accepting and probably like I did just kind of assume that that would be my path. Um, so yeah, it was really just the growing up experience where I had so much of that stigma. Oh, unfortunately. Well, that's great with your family. How about you, Courtney, with your family? Yeah, similar. My family was wonderful, so accepting. And when I came out, I basically announced that I was entering this relationship with this woman. And then we were together for five years and we lived together and we got engaged before same-sex marriage had been approved. So I don't know what we were thinking, but we were <laughs> thinking ahead. Um, yeah, my family was really wonderful, which I think is is amazing because I know so many families that are not. Great. Yeah, that, that's great. What would you say to other uh, bisexual identifying 
people that where their families are not as as warm and welcoming. Yeah, I would say a couple of things. What I've seen from some of the people in my community and some clients too is sometimes it just takes time for them to accept. Not all family members come around, but I've seen a lot of them do over time. So just be patient. And I just think focus on love as much as possible. So be kind to the family members. I mean, unless the family members are being abusive or really unkind, that's a whole different situation. But if they're just having a hard time accepting, but they're being kind, as kind as possible, then be kind with them and be loving. And um, and, and I think the most important thing is to just love yourself and surround yourself with people who do accept you. Because I think of that concept of chosen family or soul family, that just because we have our family of origin doesn't mean we don't have other people who are more kindred spirits kind of like our yeah like family of choice great Rachel what would you say to others where their family's not as accepting it's a tough one and I really don't have a ton of experience with that you know I think what Courtney said is really important it's really important to know yourself and to love yourself and to be accepting of who you are and from that place, I mean, if you're just living your truth, there's very, I mean, it's unfortunate, of course, if your family doesn't come around, but it doesn't prevent you from living your life, especially if you're an adult living on your own. I mean, I think if you're a teenager, a young adult, you still live at home or you're supported by your parents, it's really hard to have that kind of a strain in your relationship. Um, but you living your truth is more important. Um, but again, it's so personal and I can understand, um, even waiting to come out or, or dropping the subject with family, if you can't do so like safely, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll kind of now talk about faith. We're talking about family. Now we'll talk about faith. Uh, cause I know a little bit about Courtney. Um, how, how does your experience of bisexuality impact your your faith or your religion? No, well, I I grew up Christian, like I said, and and then when I was in my like late teens, early twenties, I started expanding my spiritual beliefs. So I no longer identify as Christian, although I always say like you know I still I grew up with Christian values, so I still embody lots of wonderful values from Christianity. But now I would just say I'm spiritual, but not religious. And sometimes I say my religion is love. And, and so what I would say, you know, how that relates to my bisexuality is, I really feel that we are souls having a human experience. And I really feel like on a soul level, we all have, we're made of energy, and we all have masculine energy and feminine energy. And so this is kind of the way I see the world. So when I even think about bisexuality, which the definition of bisexuality is the capacity for attraction, sexual attraction and or romantic attraction to more than one gender or the whole gender spectrum. So it's, I always think that's interesting. It's like the capacity for attraction um, cause sometimes people just think bisexual people are attracted to everyone, which, right, yes. you know, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's something about just honoring that if we all have masculine energy and we all have feminine energy and that has nothing to do with gender, it's just this kind of a feeling or energy within us. Um, then it, it just, for me, kind of broadens my perspective on the world. And even when I think about my own attractions, I'm usually attracted to someone's energy or their soul or the, like who they really are. And I love that phrase, love the person, not the gender. Right. And so that's it just to me and kind of my own spiritual beliefs help me see the world in a deeper way that goes a lot uh, deeper than the surface. And it all kind of fits together for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Rachel, do you have any comment on that question? Yeah, I was also raised Christian, uh, Catholic to be precise. I was never totally bought in. Um, 
which is interesting. I think because my mother was Jewish, my dad was Catholic. And so I kind of got both views early on that I love my parents, but they believe different things. So one of them can't be like right or wrong. I just kind of had that feeling. Um, and I also grew up with a gay second cousin. So my dad's best friend, my second cousin was gay. And even though my dad sort of didn't approve, he was also his best friend. And so I saw like the weird dynamics that faith and um, being different, being, you know, gay or bi had on people, you know, like these are people, it's not just a belief that we're dealing with. So I never felt uncomfortable with the faith part of this. It wasn't really a factor in me. I wasn't worried about that just because we had, um, we had my cousin in the family who um, we all loved and it wasn't ever a big deal. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we've been talking about family a lot and, and Rachel and I think Courtney, you both brought up your chosen family and oftentimes uh, LGBTQ plus individuals will find their chosen family at LGBTQ plus events or organizations. What um, LGBTQ plus organizations, what can they do better to help serve the bisexual population? Yeah, I think just generally honoring bisexual individuals, uh, uh, coming with an attitude that bisexual people matter and that they're very present. Because there's some studies, I, I just looked it up today from the, the Williams Institute from UCLA. They did numerous surveys and they found that over half of LGB people are bisexual. So there's a lot of bisexual people even in the LGBTQ community. But I, I also noticed that for bisexual people who maybe are in a monogamous relationship, they might appear like they are either straight or right. gay, mm -hmm. right? And I know, you know, when I was with this um, in my the relationship with a woman for five years, I just a lot of people just assumed I was a lesbian. Mm -hmm. And then when I've had time when I'm with a man, a lot of people assume I'm straight, and you know, and that's one of the reasons I wrote my <laughs> book too. And I'm really open about being bisexual because it, it's kind of invisible. You know, no one would know that I'm bisexual if I don't say it. Um, unless I have multiple people on my arms walking down the street, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think just recognizing that there are a lot of bisexual people. Bisexual people are people too. There's a lot of discrimination and stigma even within the LGBTQ plus communities. And I think one thing that would be really easy is honor things like Bisexual Health Awareness Month in March, Bisexual Visibility Month in September and Bi Visibility Day September 23rd, just honoring those. And, and I think also for organizations that have support groups, maybe having one that's specifically for bisexual people or somehow giving bisexual people a voice where they can say what they think, just like you're giving, you know, Molly, Tommy's giving Rachel and I this voice tonight to share our experiences. I think any ways that bisexual people can share what their own personal experiences are, as well as maybe some of the prejudices they've received, mm -hmm. um, but all from a lens of understanding and compassion, because I think it's all about all of us working together to create an inclusive community. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I hear, you know, I've been working within the LGBTQ plus community for, for 15 years. And um, I, I, last week, I just heard, you know, some more stigma, like, oh, that person's with a woman now. And oh, well, maybe, maybe that person's straight now instead of gay. And, uh, you know, and I guess just educating the LGBTQ community, the whole community as a whole, uh, by, by having those awareness months too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Cause I mean, I remember I was with a lesbian couple and they were asking me more about me being bisexual and they just said like, oh, you'll, you'll kind of like, you'll see the light. You'll realize that you're a lesbian. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, mean, I honor lesbians, of course, but like, this mm -hmm. is, I know my own sexual orientation. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I've been working in the community and, uh, 
uh, oftentimes the, the lesbian women will, will joke with me, oh, you'll see, you know, you'll be <laughs> No, I'm straight. I'm comfortable being straight. <laughs> so Rachel, do you have anything to add how, how LGBTQ organizations can better serve the bisexual population? You know, it's funny because I've not been a huge community member. I think maybe because of what you're talking about, like I never completely felt comfortable um, going to a lot of events and showing up. And I mean, part of that has become I'm really introverted. So it's not just what's already out there, but um, I also learned last year that I'm autistic and I know my pride center has had off and on like a neurodivergent support group, which mm -hmm. I think I would be much more apt to go to now, um, which I also do think is related to my, my gender identity and my sexual orientation. Um, but as far as, first, I never really felt I needed like support for being bisexual. So I haven't really reached out, but I also felt like I wasn't, this is gonna sound, terrible like I wasn't gay enough to go to pride events and stuff like <laughs> mm -hmm. you know I've I've been with uh, a number of genders in my day but mostly with a man so I do appear straight to a lot of people I do do my best though to be vocal about the fact that I'm not straight just because I don't want this mm -hmm. to be so invisible like Courtney's saying I want to be representative. I want other people to feel comfortable coming to me if they are um, like, you know, non-heterosexual. Um, so I don't know what they could do better, but like, I know that I have been shy about finding community, not just because of them, also because I'm pretty, pretty shy. <laughs> Do you think, I've been hearing this in the community, do you think it's easier to be perceived as a woman and bisexual than as a man who's bisexual? Yeah, I definitely think so. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in some places, being a bisexual woman is cool. There's a lot of celebrities that identify mm -hmm. as bisexual. And yeah, I do. I think the stigma for men is more intense partially because of so this toxic masculinity and the version of what it means to be masculine and so this stigma for gay men is pretty intense and then also for bisexual men and I mean I have a few male friends cisgendered male who have had a few same-sex experiences but they wouldn't identify as bisexual per se but I just, I always find that so fascinating too. It's like, if we didn't have all these labels um, and I'm not anti-label, I think labels are very helpful. I mean, I love being bisexual and I love that label or pansexual sometimes I'll say too, but I'm just saying like a lot more people have same sex attractions or multiple gender attractions mm -hmm. than actually would identify themselves with a particular label. And so I just, I just think there's, there's a lot to it, you know, and it kind of reminds me of Lisa, Lisa Diamond, the professor, PhD, did an amazing longitudinal study over 10 years studying women, cisgenders, wi cisgender women's sexuality. And her book is called Sexual Fluidity. And she published the book, I think it was in 2009. And she found that women's sexuality is a lot more fluid than fixed. So for example, um, even women who identify as lesbian, they might at some point in their life, some of the women in the study, I should say, <laughs> fell in love maybe with their male best friend and were surprised that they were feeling this attraction to a man because they identified so much as lesbian. And I'm just saying uh, sexual orientation is still being studied. It's, it's still something that we're learning about and it has more of a fluid dynamic to it than just people are this or this or this although sometimes people are really you know That's certain right. on, you know so it's complex I guess I'm saying mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah what's one thing about bisexuality that you wish 
everybody else would understand, not only the, the queer community, but but everyone um, everyone else to the, the straight community as well. We'll start off with you, Rachel. Well, the first thing that came to mind when you were speaking is just like how beautiful it is to, to have um, like a one less boundary to love. You know, like if you are more open hearted and open attracted, um, there's more people to love. There's more potential for love. There's more potential for appreciation and experience. And so I think also in specifically in um, a same sex relationship or similar same gender, same body type, um, you can learn a lot about yourself and that in itself is a marvel. Like there's just something to that, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. It's it's a different kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of potential for growth and new experience. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I think one thing is there's a common misconception that bisexual people are going to cheat, just mm -hmm. almost like they they can't be monogamous, they're going to cheat. And I, I know in dating situations, I've I've navigated that of what I want to be very upfront that I'm bisexual and test the person's comfort level with that. And and but from the, I haven't looked this up in a long time, but the last I had looked it up, about half of bisexual people are monogamous and half are polyamorous or in an open relationship, which would be in an honest, open situation where every partner knows that, you know, the person is with other people. So totally in an ethical, honest, open way. But I don't know if it's still the same, like half and half, but I'm just saying it's up to each bisexual person to know what is really best for them or to try different things over time. But just because someone's bisexual doesn't mean they're hypersexual. Doesn't mean they're going to be having sex right. with everybody. <laughs> I wonder how those numbers compare to uh, people that identify cisgender or straight people uh, and how, uh, you know, uh, the, the the cheating statistics or how faithful they are compared to the, the bisexual uh, statistics. Absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, I know we've only been talking a half hour, but we've only had two panelists. So we have one last question for you. Who is your bisexual superhero and why? I love this question. <laughs> I would say, well, I kind of have two, if that's okay. But one is Lisa Diamond, who wrote this book, sexual fluidity although she's not bisexual she's a lesbian but <laughs> but because she is such a bisexual advocate and you know activist and has done such great research so I I hold her in high regard and then also is thinking of Robin Oaks who is bisexual and an activist and author and speaker and she's absolutely amazing and has been at it for many many years how about you Rachel you know, it's kind of interesting. I I don't know if I have one. I I'm not sure. I mean, I'm I'm sure I know of many people that I admire who are bisexual, but none came to mind today that I could call out as as someone in this instance. And I don't even know why, but I feel like there's something to that. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, maybe also, you know, Courtney brought up a good point that a lot of, of uh, men don't want to come out. So I was trying to think of, of more uh, men also as, as advocates uh, or, or identify as bisexual and, and I couldn't really uh, find too much information. So that may also be the reason why too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But I love what Rachel said too about bisexuality. It's beautiful. And it's, I think it's definitely something for us to celebrate for those who are bisexual or for those who are not, but have bisexual people in their lives. It's, it's just a, it's like the, it reminds me of how diverse planet earth is and people are right. There's so many different ways that we're all 
unique and authentic. And I think it's just about not not judging each other and having compassion and celebrating our differences and our similarities too. Yeah, that's great. And that's a, a great uh, point to land on and to, to be finished this evening. Do you, Rachel, do you have any last uh, words that you would like to, to say? Yeah, I just, I think there's so many labels we can choose nowadays and it can, it can be hard, especially for me personally, it can be hard to know what to land on. What do I call myself? You know, mm -hmm. um, so just use whatever works for you. You know, I still consider myself bisexual, even though I don't consider myself to have one gender. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's your life, it's your body, it's your mind. You get to call yourself whatever you want and just be proud of who you are. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Courtney, for participating in this month's panel. Uh, really enjoyed the answers and hopefully uh, will influence uh, the viewers and help them feel more comfortable with who they are. And uh, we'll have our next panel in April, and I'll see everybody else on Molly Tommy. Have a good night. <laughs>